Well, welcome all to this session on transitioning from legacy Toco to the new software. Um, one of the big things that we've found with the release of V23 back in 2022, I believe, tail end of that, was that a lot of users seem to struggle to switch between the different versions that carry across their settings. So the aim of today's session is to A, familiarize yourselves with the new settings, and B, show you how to navigate bringing those settings across. Now, if anyone is having issues with transferring their settings, uh, you have access to my email, which will appear at the end of the session as well. Uh, don't hesitate to contact me if you have any issues with it. I am more than happy to help you transfer your settings across. So a bit of housekeeping for today, a uh, quick overview. We're going to be going over a quick rundown of the old versus new with the software packages. I'm briefly going to touch on the new licensing that got added with the release of Stringer V24, along with showing the brand new survey string settings form and the point settings where you can control a lot of, well, all of your settings. Once we've gone through that, we'll go through an example showing how you can bring your settings across. Uh, I will show you guys both with CSV file formats, which is a common one that users use with legacy. Uh, and that will also show the SDB format, which is the second uh, used format for settings. Once we've done that, I'll also briefly show you a sneak peek of what will be upcoming with the software. Uh, and what actually plans to be covered in a future webinar that we're planning, which I think will excite a number of you. So first off, new versus old, what can we look at as an improvement between the old version and the new? First off, speed. Speed is a massive improvement between the two versions. Uh, anyone who has loaded up the latest iteration of the software, I hope you guys have brought in some data and seen what the change is. In some cases, uh, if you're working with larger jobs, actually in 100% of cases, you will find that the speed increase can be up to 400% faster. One of the jobs I like to test on is a uh, 31,000 point file and bringing that in using legacy stringer uh, on my machine uh, can't be done. Using the brand new version of the software, I can bring it in within 30 seconds. So I hope that gives a example of that. Greater attribute control is another massive benefit of the software, bringing in uh, various attributes and popul populating them within the drawing has never been easier, along with improvements to connect to import all that data. We have new capabilities in the survey string manager for being able to edit all your data, which I'll go through later, along with now being able to do point group transformations being able to apply a helmet or an affine transformation to your data. Quick edit capabilities, anyone who registered for our web session last time, uh, we actually cover the new quick edit tools that got added. If you're curious about those, uh, look up our YouTube channel. Uh, we go in depth with a lot of that, along with the brand new cadastral tools that have been added to the software. Furthermore, we now have a dedicated tool space that's been added to the software. From here, anyone who's not really a ribbon person but still wants access to their data, especially if you're working on smaller jobs, I find that the tool space is a great addition. I'll be running through this today to show you guys how to transfer your settings along with showing the ribbon commands. Multi-symbols is a great addition to the software, allowing you to apply multiple symbols to aspects of your drawing. Say, for instance, you have pit information needs to be brought in. You are able to tell the software whether or not uh, you want to add multiple symbols to that or not. Similar for trees, you are able to add in the size of the canopy along with the size of the trunk. And if you wish, even a Z axis for a height as needed. Comparison reports have also been updated for the latest version of the software. These are planned to be covered in a future session along with being able to work with multiple surfaces and improvements within the model viewer software. Any surveyors in the audience that also work with CSD users, uh, primarily engineers, uh, we now have full integration with the CSD software, allowing for seamless transition between the two packages. 
So I hope that guy gets everyone a bit excited. Now, I just briefly want to touch on the brand new licensing that's been added to the software. Uh, anyone who didn't want to update due to the fact that network licensing was not available, please be aware network licensing is available as of V25. Uh, if you want to discuss that, you're more than welcome to contact me outside of the session to update your license keys to network again. To access your new keys, you are able to get to our customer portal. Our customer portal can be accessed through the website or through a link that would have been provided when uh, you got when we released V25. For anyone curious, just go to the Stringer Survey Suite site, go over to Support, Licensing and Installation, and that will take you to the customer portal and you're able to access it from here. Once you get into there, you'll be able to see all the license keys available to you as the user, along with being able to disable keys as needed. If Bob down the road uh, is using the key and you don't want him using that, you are able to uh, kick them off of the license as needed. It'll also tell you how many you have access to along with when they've been activated and who's activated them. So you have a lot more control over this now. If you're needing to download the latest version of the software, again, an email was sent out uh, for anyone that subscribes to our newsletter. Uh, along with uh, whoever your main contact is within your company. This will take you to the downloads portal where you can download it, or you can access our downloads page and download any version that you wish from there. Once you have downloaded the software, simply open up the, well, the software package you're intending to use. There are two ways to gain access to the license. Either try running a command. If the license is not currently active, it will ask you to enter a license key, or you can select the license button, uh, as I will show shortly. Actually, let's do a, a practical demonstration. So as you can see on screen at the moment, I have a civil 3D drawing open. And if you're wanting to activate a license, simply come over to the license activation option found here. This is found under the string of survey banner. Select that option and it will open up the CSA Licensing Manager. From here, simply go Activate License and activate the license as needed. If you're needing to activate a network license, you are able to set a premise path to be able to activate the network license based on the network path that you have available to you. For more information on this, please see our website where we do have an installation guide to make this process easier. Now, What's new with survey strings? So survey strings has been heavily upgraded uh, between the iterations of the software. Uh, one of the biggest benefits we've got is that you're now able to have multiple code sets within the drawing. Say for instance, you are trying to lodge to various councils. Those councils can sometimes have uh, rules set in place for how exactly codes are meant to be set. You are able to freely customize this now. If uh, a certain council doesn't want break lines, they only want the 3D line work, the 2D line work, you are able to set that and then be able to switch between them as needed. As stated, we now have dedicated uh, break line creation. Anyone in the past who was relying on your 3D line work to create your break lines, that's no longer needed. Uh, you can create break lines and 3D line work independently of each other. 2D line work can also be created independently of either of those. Modifying codes has never been easier. In the past, editing, uh, in my personal opinion, was a fair bit of a chore. Now we have the ability to edit multiple codes at the same time uh, and even being able to uh, maneuver them around as needed. We have new mass editing tools as outlined there with the override selector tool allowing us to very quickly override anything needed. Once you've done the changes needed, uh, Apply Global Settings allows you to rapidly finish off these settings, uh, applying them to any future templates that you open. What this also means, though, is that you can apply local settings. If you need to only have settings applied for a particular job and you're not needing it to be applied to different ones, you are able to set up a local settings database for you to be able to pull information into. Um, 
it's very niche area for that, but I have found it to be very useful for certain clients. The other area where setting can be applied is the point settings. Uh, Civil Threader users, we do love the description key set uh, option for being able to use that. That's still the core of your point settings. However, for reporting functionality uh, and different attribute information, we do require a point settings uh, code set to be set up. This is very easy and I'll be showing you how to do this today, uh, but it allows you to do things such as multiple codes within your drawing, user-defined property support, code report, and multi-symbols. All of these are controlled by the point settings. So just to show what I mean by that, you can see that I have a drawing here with some data already imported. And this is using the settings that have been set up using the latest version of the software. First off, let's have a look at how these strings are being sorted. So you can see here that I have two codes associated to one of my strings. The multi-coding aspect is taking over here. I'm able to string everything up based on my survey strings. And that information is then being read as a multi-code and the point is able to load both of them. Within the software, you are able to hold up to five codes on a point. If anyone does use more than five uh, codes for a point, please let me know. Uh, it's kind of a personal quest of mine to find out how many codes people use with the current max being eight, if anyone's curious. If you're wanting to look at the survey string settings, these actually get applied dynamically. If you need to make any changes to these after the line work's been created, you can do so. So looking at my codes in the drawing, uh, I know that it's one of the numeric ones that's been added. So proof that you're able to have multiple code lists being brought in with the same codes. If I wanted to update any of this, uh, let's say I want to break line to be created for my 01 code. I'm able to apply that go apply and close. I can then update my drawing and those settings get applied. Let's actually do something that's a bit uh, more visual. Let's have a look for our 601 codes. And let's say we don't want 2D line work to be created. I'm going to go apply and close. I'm then going to update my drawing. Let's actually try deleting our strings and we'll remake them. This is another benefit. You are able to actually remove your strings as needed. Let's manually get rid of them. And we'll recreate the strings now. So from here, I'm able to tell it, okay, I want to, to use a particular point group, controllable. I'm wanting to use alpha individual layers, create my strings. The code set, as I discussed earlier, is required for certain uh, reporting functions. So I want to make sure that this is set. I'm going to go OK. And you can see now the 60101 is no longer being coded because it hasn't been set by the survey string settings. If I want to switch that up, I can go back in here. I can go down to 60101. I'm going to go apply and close here. And you can see that that got updated. It got created after I set that. So you do have that control over. If you're wanting to work with multi-coding, you just need to make sure that when you create your points, you create them with the asterisk at the end of the code. And I will show you guys how to quickly add that at a later time. The other area this comes into play though, is with aspects such as multi-symbols. So multi-symbols is a new command that was added to the software and allows you to rapidly add multiple symbols to a point. You can see that I have uh, three sets of trees here. And these trees have different uh, size scales attached to them. You can see here my first one, 201, I only have a singular scale of two. So only a single block has been created for this. For this one over here, I've got two separate scales, 0.8 and 6. So two different symbols have been created here. These are created through the multi-symbols command found here and can be customized to create as many symbols as needed based on these parameters. Again, this is all controlled through the settings. You can see I have scale set here. So the drawing is separating those points out, separating the point description out based on that. So if I go into point code set here, I go down to numeric individual layers and I go looking for my 201 code. 
you can see I have code and scale set as a description format. Now, the description format being set is set within here, description formats. Opening up description formats and going down to uh, code scale, you can see that the first property is being set as a code and the second is being set as a scale. So it's able to read that information. It's being separated out via a space. So anytime it finds a space, it's using that to decide a different property. Those properties can then be read by the software to do the multi symbols. In a similar fashion, if you're wanting to use custom properties for uh, any of your data, you need to tell the software how it's going to be breaking those down. Now, the way to do this is again, well, actually this time you're going to go into point styles and you need to set a point property list for it to read off of. Opening up the point property list, you have all this information here that can be set. We're able to add custom properties as needed and you are able to work with it as needed. There will be a future uh, webinar on how to apply custom properties. This is just a small taste of what you can do with them. So on that, you have your settings set here and all you have to do is bring your data in and you're good to go. So this is just a brief rundown of how exactly that works. If you, uh, sorry, from there though, we actually want to look at how do we switch over our settings? How do we bring in the legacy settings across to the new version? So it's very simple within Stringer, when you open up the survey line set table, there is an option to add uh, from the Stringer database. Now the SDB format is uh, a format that we created for legacy Stringer. If you have an SDB file, uh, you're able to bring it across directly. If you have a CSV file, you are able to uh, use the migration file. Now the migration file is a file that we created to allow you to create an SDB basically. The file can be acquired either through direct contact with us, or it will also be attached to the YouTube uh, video uh, when it's uploaded, I believe tomorrow. So either way, you are able to gain access to that file format. If you are wondering where the settings file lives, open up your legacy Stringer topo, go over to Stringer settings. And once you're within Stringer settings, you will find that your CSV or SDB file will be located at this address. So let's go over to a template file that I want to actually bring settings over into. So I'm switching over to this template drawing. And within here, we wanna make sure of a few things. First off, I want to make sure the description key set is set up and ready to be used. So I'm going to switch over to Toolspace. Anyone who's not sure how to access that, go to Home and then hit the Toolspace option. That will either activate or deactivate Toolspace as needed. Select Settings here, then go Point, Description Key Set, and just make sure that you have a description key set that you're wanting to use. So everything should be set up uh, within Civil 3D, including the description key set. Anyone who's wanting to switch from legacy to new, just use your original template. Uh, there won't be any issues. The second thing you're wanting to make sure of is that your layers all exist. So type in the layer command to open up the layers tab and just make sure layers are set up as you're expecting them to be. Because we're not going to be creating layers outside of one particular circumstance. Uh, the software is looking for all of these layers to pre-exist. So you just want to make sure these are here. Once you're confident in that, or if you're just wanting to do a bit more checking, uh, navigate to your file. So I have a CSV file here that I'll be uh, turning into an SDB file. So I'm just going to open that. And this will just be opened up in Excel. From here, you're just wanting to have a look at the file itself. And this is broken down in a number of different ways. First off, you have the code. So the first column is going to be the code that you're working with. The second column is going to be whether or not you were creating 3D break lines, 3D poly lines, 2D line work. Uh, based on your settings within legacy. So we need to pull that information across. Next, you have the 2D layer information. So we need to be able to read that and the 3D information. 
So what you're going to want to do is just confirm that these two layered columns match up to whatever layers you have currently within your drawing template or your future drawing template. Once that's done, you're going to want to open up uh, the civil 3D migration file that uh, we're going to work with. And this is going to be the file we're going to be using to transfer our settings across. So I'm just going to move this onto another screen quickly. And all I'm going to do, actually I'll keep it half on here. All I'm going to do is select up the top here just to get the entire column. Actually, that's, that's why I do it. I'm actually just going to copy all of this. So I've got everything here that I want to work with. Hit the copy option. Select the first cell under code here because that first row there is not going to be read by the software as we're expecting it to be just label names. And then just go control V to paste that information in. So all of this is now in here ready to go. We just need to slot it into its right tabs. So highlight everything except the code option because the codes are pretty much good to go. And then we're just going to move these across like so. So you should find that your break line options are set under break line. So this is whether or not you're going to have a 3D polyline, 2D polyline uh, break line. 2D layer should have the layers set underneath it. And you will have to move over the 3D layer column here uh, just by one, just to make it fit, uh, just to make it so that it's underneath the 3D layer option. So you should get something that looks a lot like this. Your values will probably differ, but this is what we're looking for here. Once done, simply go save. Close down the CSV file. Uh, we're pretty much done with the editing of that now. And what you're going to want to do is just select the file. It'll switch over to an editing format like this and just change that CSV on the end to SDV. It's going to ask, are you sure you're wanting to change this? We're sure, so we're going to go yes. And that file is now ready to edit. So I'm just going to move that out of the way for now. And we're going to go back to Stringer Survey. And you've got two ways of accessing string, survey string settings. Earlier, I activated it using the ribbon option on here, but let's have a look at the tool space. I'm going to select the tool space, which is the new area you can go to be able to do a lot of your edits. I'm going to right click on template file. This is the name of the drawing. And I'm going to choose uh, my survey string settings. Now, this is something I brought up earlier layers only get created under a certain circumstance. Uh, I already have uh, some settings already installed on here. It's telling me your settings already exist, but the layers don't exist for it. Do you want to create them? In this case, I want to go no, because I'm creating a new template to work. So that's going to open up here. And what we're going to do is create a new table for us to copy these settings onto. So create a new table, and let's just call this new string settings. Once you set that, you go down to add from Stringer SDV and navigate to where your file is. So I'm just going to paste down here the location. And you should see that the SDV file is now ready to be used. So I'm going to double click that. And the software is going to go ahead and bring all the information in. Now, if you find that your 2D layers have come in on layer zero, it means that your layers have not been added to your drawing. Uh, just means that you need to just make sure that everything uh, is as you expect. So when I've used this file, I must not have checked the names of them. Yep, I've got a line at the end. That's why it hasn't been brought in. That's on me. But that's how you're expecting it to work. Once they've been brought in, the 2D layer is going to line up and you'll get something that looks a lot more like this. So your 2D layers will be whatever you've got set in the drawing and everything will be brought over automatically. You should, shouldn't should find that there are any zero layers in here. If you do find there are any, uh, simply go to where the zero layer is, drop this down and just select the one that you want to be switched to. One thing to take note of is that you do want this little asterisk to be at the end of your code. The asterisk is telling the software to look for this exact value. It's looking for 001 as the code and no other information. 
for numeric codes, this doesn't matter quite as much, but I still highly recommend doing this. Uh, where this comes more into play is with alpha coding. Alpha coding generally has a lot of values that look very similar. For instance, you can see I have here bi and then bin, bin for bin. If you don't have the asterisk attached to the end of these, what happens is the software looks for the closest match. If you have BI, a BIN code and a BI code, every single time Stringer is going to choose the BI as the code without the asterisk uh, because it sees that as the first value that it chooses. BI is the first one, and then the end just gets associated with a different code or the string number, and it's going to ignore it completely. So you just need to make sure the asterisk is on the end there. The easiest way to apply this is just to simply select the table you're wanting to work with. Actually, let's do it to the alpha one. Select the one you're wanting to work with. Hit Control A to select everything in the database here. And then just select the Add Remove Asterisk option. That will allow you to very quickly switch between these. There are certain circumstances where you may want to have that asterisk removed. If you've accidentally added something to the code and you're wanting it to search for the other one, remove the asterisk and it will search for the closest match it can, basically. So it can be a very powerful tool. If you're needing to override a number of these codes, so if you're needing to edit certain ones, let's say I just want to edit these ones here, I'm able to select the ones needed using control, go override selected, and from here, I'm able to edit this information as needed. Let's say I don't want break lines added to these. So I'm going to leave this toggled off as that's how I want to be represented. Toggle these off as I don't need these edited and then select the override selected option. You can see the add break line options are now unhighlighted. These are no longer going to create break lines for my survey. So you have full control over this. Very easy to be able to go ahead and do the edits to the survey settings as needed. Once you've done the edits to the survey line set table, ensure you select the set as global option. The set as global is going to set this for any future templates that you open. So just keep that in mind. You only need to set this up once for a particular drawing, um, and it can be used for any future templates from there. If you are wanting to rapidly switch between 2D line work and 3D line work, uh, as you can see here, I have all three being created. You can actually use the global commands down the bottom here. Now, what these do is override the settings set here. At the moment, uh, the software has been told create 2D line work, but don't create 3D line work. Keep in mind, break lines are now separate from 3D line work, so break lines will be created regardless of the settings for these two. So if I wanted 3D line work to be created, I would need to toggle that on and then go apply and close. If I didn't want 2D line work to be created, I can toggle that off or I can toggle it off in here. The option's up to you. So just keep that in mind. Once you're done, go apply and close and that's your survey strings ready to be used. Now the software is in a usable state at this point. You're able to go ahead, bring in data, work with it, do a lot of the basic functionality within Stringer. But if you're wanting access to a few of the higher level commands, uh, things such as the code report, uh, being able to use the multi-symbols, anything like that, you're going to need to make sure that your point code set has also been set up. Now, what this means is setting up your uh, description format and point style, depending on what you're wanting to use the software for, you don't need to set these up um, as such. Uh, it depends on what you want to use them for. Now, to set this up though, what you need to do is go back to the tool space, go down to the version you're wanting to import. So in this case, I'm going to use the description key set numeric. I'm going to go edit keys to open up this database here. Select the first code and go control A. Right click and go copy to clipboard. Now, this may take a couple of attempts. Um, Civil 3D I have found for some reason doesn't always like copying things, but that's the process you're going to go through. You're then going to go back to point code set. Actually, let's open it through the tool space here. Let's go to point code set. Again, we're going to create a new table. So let's call this one new point code set. 
And then we're going to go append civil 3D description key set. That's going to import all of our data directly from the description key set ready for us to use. Point styles and description formats are going to be set to default, that being default and description full. Uh, just modify the codes you're wishing to use this for as needed. For instance, if you're wanting to work with uh, multi-symboling for trees, just scroll down to whichever code you're using for trees and just make sure it's on that code, description code scale one uh, to be able to be used. Point style, as said, uh, is mainly used, well, primarily used for being able to apply uh, property information to it. Um, there will be a future webinar on that. Once you're done with that, you're able to go ahead and save this. So drop down Civil 3D, go save as drawing. Drop down this option down here and just make sure you save it as ADWT. That way, any future drawings you're wanting to do with this uh, can be used directly from this DWT file. Once you've done that, you're ready to start importing all of your data. So why don't we have a go at it? Again, I've just created a template file. I'm not wanting to work with a template file. Um, I'm opening on a template file, but now I'm wanting to use a DWG file format. So go to desktop. Um, I'm just going to save my PSS folder, webinars, save it in here. So I'm going to switch it back to a DWG now. So this is me importing the data using the settings that we've just done. From here, I'm going to go import and reduce. Import and reduce is where you would go to import your data. If you're wanting to use the tool space, you'll find connect down here. Connect allows you to also run this command. Well, actually, I'll reset it. Any command that's on the ribbon uh, can be found within the tool space, but some, I think the most recent commands got added that were shown in the last webinar we did are the only ones not currently found on there. Uh, so yeah. Under connect, you're going to want to go file, new project. Call this one Jones Oval. One thing uh, to mention in here within settings, uh, if you come over to default styles, depending on which code set you're wanting to use, you can set up the defaults for this. So if I wanted to say, set mine to be a different numeric one, uh, I wanted to use numeric code instead of individual layers, you are able to set that as needed. So once you install the latest version of Stringer, if you're bringing over your own unique ones, I highly recommend removing the defaults that are installed and just making sure that these switch over to your values. Similar to the other setup, once you've done this, once you don't have to do it again, uh, it's just good to know about. Once you've done that, create projects. Uh, we're wanting to add some data to this, so we'll call it day one. So I'm just bringing an SDR format here. Create update cargo points. It's going to go ahead and create all those points very quickly. And now it's going to ask, do we want to create survey lines? I recommend creating them at this point, but if you're wanting to visualize your survey before you uh, create the line work, you're more than, more than welcome to go no and create them at a later time, similar to what I did earlier with create strings. So I'm going to go yes here. Uh, it's just warning me that there are layers. Uh, do I want to create them? This is uh, where you can create them based on your settings file. Uh, in this case, I'm going to go yes. You're asked to select a point group uh, that's already been created. So line work is only being created for the point group you have selected. In this case here, I'm selecting controllable civil 3D as I'm wanting my break lines and that to be applied to the controllable one. So that's going to be set. Uh, the survey line set table has correctly set itself to numeric based on what I set within the file uh, create project option I chose earlier. And then I'm going to go create survey strings. It's now saying, okay, I've got all this information. What code set should I apply to it for any future functionality? Numeric individual layers, again, has been set based on the create project option that I selected earlier. The string of default has been set to numeric individual. 
and it's saying what surface am I applying those brake lines to? So I'm wanting to select NS because that's where my brake line is being applied to. The FLT file uh, is a new addition to Stringer uh, from V23, I believe. Uh, what this means is that all of your brake line files that get created within Civil 3D get merged into one FLT file. This rapidly increases the speed of uh, file creation and editing. So instead of your computer having to sift through a number of brake line files, it's instead able to use all of its processes on a single FLT file. So I'm going to go OK here, and the software has already gone ahead and created all of that line work based on the settings that I just chose. So it's a very powerful tool for that. Furthermore, because I've got my tree set up uh, with the properties to be able to import this data here based on what I chose earlier, I can go into things such as, actually, before I do that, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, before I do that, I want to make sure that my data has been linked. Now, what this means is that Stringer requires a link to Civil 3D to be able to function. At the moment, if I go into Civil 3D points link, uh, you can actually see that everything gets linked automatically. You're just wanting to make sure that these are linked. If any of these aren't linked and you're wanting the information to be read by Civil 3D or Stringer, uh, whichever one you've loaded the data into, you need to make sure the point group they're assigned to is linked. Now, the point group itself has been created through Civil 3D. So you can see here, I have a list of all of my Civil 3D point groups. I need to, again, make sure these are linked for any of strings functionality to be able to affect these and vice versa. Once all that has been linked, your point code set, your survey string settings all get applied to the points and we're able to work with them. So again, this means if I go into things such as multi-symbols where I have all this information, trees hasn't been updated, so I'm just gonna update that. I go into multi-symbols, check this, go, okay, trees by radius, that's what I'm wanting to work with. Quickly, you don't have to use trees by radius. You're able to use diameter, you can create a 3D block, all that's available here. But I'm telling it, I want this information to be applied to point group trees. The layer that I'm wanting these blocks to be created on can be customized as needed. I'm just gonna leave mine on vegetation. Your parameter count is going to decide what's going to be applied to which. So in this case here, one parameter, it's going to assign the block of tree using the scale one, so that's the two. Again, hearkening back to the file format we saw earlier, or I showed you guys earlier, where you have code and then space, scale. So it's reading that information. So all that gets set um, and it's going to create that block on this tree here. For this one though, I have three parameters. So it's going to create two different blocks based on scale one and then scale two to create two different size blocks. So let's go create update symbols. And you can see that an information gets created. So what this means is you no longer have to rely on the Civil 3D side of things to create these. Um, personally, I find it to be a lot easier to just set the parameters in the field, come back to the office, run the multi-symbols command and have it created. I've used it for trees in this circumstance, but can be used for other aspects. Another area that's really cool is you can go into code report. Code report allows you to scan through your drawing and see what the if there are any codes that don't add up basically. So in this case, I can scan the point group couturable. I will move that out of the way for now. Uh, and I'm able to see what's been used. By default, it's going to use the point code set and the survey string settings to scan for any code that it doesn't recognize. Any that it doesn't recognize will be highlighted in blue, black such. Double clicking on that for a bit of information, uh, you're able to actually find all the points. If I move this out of the way, let you see I can zoom to each of them to be able to do any edits I may want to do. What you can also do though is let's say we're not fussed about the code set, we're actually curious about the description key set. So I can highlight that and now I get them highlighted in gray. Any codes highlighted in gray are codes that are found within my survey string settings but are not found within my Civil 3D description key set. So I can go ahead and find any of those and add them as needed. So it can be a really cool tool to be able to use, a really powerful one, depending on what you're looking for. Um, yeah. So with that, uh, we've had a look at the 
what the settings are used for, various different functionalities, being able to create line work, being able to use for various commands. We've had a look at how you would go about importing that data, uh, sorry, importing the settings, bring them across. And then we've had a go at creating data using settings. So through all that, um, you're able to import everything across. Um, yeah, if anyone does require any more help with that, please don't hesitate to reach out. We are more than happy to help you guys uh, get up to the latest version of the software. Now, um, one thing I did promise earlier was a bit of a sneak peek into what's coming. Now, custom properties are an aspect that Stringer has been looking at for a while now, uh, both in Civil 3D and uh, within our own platform. So earlier, I touched briefly on the unique properties, uh, being able to add custom properties and that. We are currently investigating applying those custom properties to the Civil 3D points themselves and being able to work with them dynamically. Uh, this is already partially in the software for anyone that watched the last webinar we did. We had a look at the Excel Connect function. Now, the Excel Connect function currently allows you to write to a property column that already exists, uh, but requires the property column to already exist before you can run it. Really cool functionality, and it's something we're really keen to move forward with. Um, I hope everyone's looking forward to seeing more about that uh, in the upcoming. Uh, there will actually be a smaller webinar coming up next month, I believe, that will actually cover uh, a bit of this, or most of this. So a little bit of a sneak peek behind the curtain for anyone curious. So with that, thank you for attending the webinar. Uh, if anyone's curious about the CAD side of things, could stay was primarily aimed at Civil 3D users. Uh, there is a QR code on screen at the moment that will cover that will take you to a link to register for next week where we will cover the CAD aspect of converting your settings across. Um, there's also a link to our YouTube page. This will be uploaded, I believe sometime tomorrow. Uh, if anyone has any questions on that or any questions based on customizing your settings, uh, please let me know. Well, thank you, Jack. Uh, I hope everybody uh, got a good uh view into what it takes to move your settings across. Um, we certainly hope you, you see that it's a fairly straightforward process to take the investment you've already made in Legacy Stringer and move that across to the new Stringer Topo. Um, there are some questions that have, have come through, Jack. So I might talk about some of the ones that we I answered while you were uh, presenting. So there was a question about how we share tables between different computers. And this was around uh, the point code set tables and the string um, set tables. Uh, so you can have a look at the answer uh, that, that I, I popped back, but basically all those settings uh, end up in a, in a settings folder. So Jack's opened up the default location here um, and uh, it is the first file there, point, no, not point code styles. The two files is Kogo, codesets.dat and survey stringersets.dat. So I have uh, documented that out um, in the in the answer. So if you want to have a look at the answers that it's written in there. Um, there was a, also a question about when you, Jack, you, you imported the uh, break lines and you said the fastest way to do is to let the software create a basically a break line file, an FLT file. Uh, the question was, where is that stored? So Jack, if you just want to flick back to uh, your drawing there, if you expand out the surface and the break lines and just click on that entry, uh, no, not that entry, you click on the word break lines. It's actually written there, but you'll see down the bottom in the description, uh, the path that it, it pops to uh, is right there. Okay, so uh, it, it is fair to say that we are storing some data in a database for you um, for uh, rapid retrieval and linking between your survey uh, import and reduction and the drawing uh, and the FLT file undoubtedly falls into that, that same spot, but you can get to the path uh, right there. So there's a, a couple of, uh, of other questions. Um, so there's a question here from, from Kieran, which is uh, sort of a, probing questions about association 
Uh, and I think this ties back to what I said about the data storage. So the question here is, hey, if we give the drawing to somebody else, they won't have access to everything that you've set up in the survey. Um, the answer is yes, they will have access to that because although the data is being stored uh, adjunct to the drawing, uh, by default in Stringer, uh, or, or you can turn it on, uh, when you save the drawing, you can have the data get packed inside the drawing. Okay, so the DWG then contains all of your survey set up. Uh, so Jack, did you cover anything about uh, the packing of the data? Uh, I didn't pack the uh, okay. data back. Okay, so just to sum this up, anybody who uses import and reduce, the software will automatically create this, this bundling of the data. So when you save the drawing, the data lives inside the drawing and goes with the drawing. If you are using a, a GPS pickup and you're not using import and reduce, but you're, you're importing the points directly with Civil 3D, then what you would do is you'd open up the, um, the pack data settings command and you would choose to uh, pack the, the data inside the drawing. So you see down the bottom, it says packed mode on. Uh, basically what that means is as soon as you save the drawing, all the data lives in there. So you can give it to anybody you like on any computer, anywhere. When they open, the data will um, be there because it's it's part of the drawing. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, the answer is you won't lose association. Uh, so there is a question here about the uh, longevity and future of Stringer Legacy. Uh, it's fair to say uh, that it has the word legacy on it because it's it's absolutely not being developed anymore. Uh, and there's no guarantees that we will be, you know, continuing uh, legacy uh, for any future versions. So uh, we, we strongly encourage people to move on to the newer platform, uh, the platform that we're continuing to develop and build upon, um, Stringer Legacy at some point, um, today or tomorrow, um, will not be available. So uh, another question has just dropped in. Um, in Stringer Legacy import files, we have the option to create point groups. So Stringer is looking for the point group to already exist uh, when you do an import. Uh, it is something that has been raised to me before about the prior functionality being able to create point groups upon import. Uh, and it is something that uh, I have brought up uh, and asked for in future development. Okay, so it's on the bugs and improvements list for consideration. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, um, I thank everybody who's contributed questions. If anyone's got any more, we'll just uh, leave the Q&A open for a few more minutes. So we'll, we'll see if any questions uh, come in, but Jack, can you just flick to the, the end screen? So look again, uh, thank you everybody for your attendance. And uh, again, I hope that you got some value out of this session. Uh, thank you, Jack, for summing up the, the process of moving data across and some of the benefits uh, in the new Stringer. Uh, you can see the web link there to a YouTube page. So as Jack said, we'll be uh, compiling up this video uh, and po poking it up there on YouTube. So you're welcome to look at it again and again and again. Um, and you're welcome to obviously share the content with others uh, who may have missed the session. So uh, otherwise, uh, as Jack did say, uh, we are doing a version of this for CAD users. Uh, so if you were using AutoCAD or BricsCAD uh, as, a, as a platform, there are some more settings uh, involved in moving the data across. Uh, and Jack will be covering that in the next webcast. Is that a week from now, Jack? Yes, that will be uh, this time next week. So this time next week. Uh, so look, that really wraps us on it. There's another question that's come in. Okay, so Jack, you might need to answer this one. The question is, what is the best file format to import? Uh, Kieran, I'm assuming this, this is in relation to import and reduce. Uh, so I'm just opening up Stringer Connect now, and here is a list of all the format files currently supported. Um, it depends on what your machine is able to export. Um, by 
default, the ones that I generally work with are SDR, RW5, and GT7, uh, the three that I'm most familiar with. But uh, we do work with a number of different file formats. Um, if you are coming from legacy, whatever you are using in legacy will be supported with the latest version. Karen, I hope that answers your question. Uh, if not, please um, make contact with, with Jack or contact us via the support portal uh, and we can provide further clarification to you on that. Uh, so look, uh, that really wraps us out. Thank you everybody for uh, attending and uh, we we'll look forward to seeing you on the next session. Thanks, Jack. See you all.